All right, everybody, welcome again to another Fantasy Grounds Fridays. Holy cow, look at that ugly mug there. Man, this uh, elevation is like taking a toll on my my dry face. Holy cow. Yeah. I need to get some I need to get some type of uh, lotion or something. Maybe next time I'll turn on the stream, my face will just be totally vaselined up. I don't know, man. <laughs> Maybe I'll go right that route. But anyway, welcome again, everybody, to another uh, Fantasy Grounds Fridays. My name is David. We've also got uh, Doug Davison here, the owner and president and CEO and uh, big kahuna of Fantasy Grounds. And we also have our very special guest this week from Chaosium Incorporated, which is Rick Mainz. And it's good to have you as well, Rick, and nice to meet you. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, our spiel that we have every week. Uh, so, Doug, what do we got coming down the pipeline uh, for Fantasy Grounds? Oh, coming down the pipeline? Oh, coming that's, down uh, the pipeline. Yep. That, that's a more difficult question. I, don't, um, I mean, we've got a we've got a queue of about twenty or so products that are in the process of uh, going through the final stages of approval. Um, there's a load of new like Pathfinder content. There's stuff from Legendary Games. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to look and see my exact list. It it pretty much rolls out every week. If you check in on on the website and on the newsletter. Um, then we'll typically, you know, let you know what just released. Uh, but as far as predicting in advance, it's a little harder, <laughs> a little uh -huh. harder to, to lock those down on a date. Well, we had uh, this week on Tuesday, we had a patch come out for a uh, couple patches actually for Starfinder and the rule set. So uh, I know that there's a couple more patches that are going to be coming out in the future. And there's actually some stuff in the test server right now that has to do with the uh, starships and the combat and stuff like that. So uh, for all of you users out there that uh, are into Starfinder and have the Starfinder rule set, that is something that is definitely coming, uh, but it is being tested now. And we just want to make sure that it's right uh, before it's put out uh, for public consumption. So, well, we also have a, we're going to have a, uh, we've got another guest lined up for next week, which is going to be a uh, math Colville. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to having him on. Uh, let's see. You can also subscribe to the Fantasy Grounds weekly email. You can do that on the website or upon checkout. There's also a little option that you can uh, opt in for that as well. Don't forget, we've got a new uh, social media team here at Fantasy Grounds. We've got four, actually four people. Man, we are, man, we're getting big, dog. I mean, we're new people, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, and all of the other great social media outlets that uh, we are a part of. And as for top sellers this week, uh, pretty much uh, D&D 5e, although there was a, a splash of the, the new Pathfinder Bestiary 3 that was on the list for a little while yesterday. But like Doug was saying, there's a bunch of Pathfinder stuff in the queue to be released here in the new future. So, But that's pretty much what we have coming on. Oh, oh also, don't forget, we've got FG Con coming up too. FG Con's coming up in April. I believe it's April 13th to the 15th. And uh, if you're new to Fantasy Grounds or if you're on the edge, download the demo version and you can go ahead and get on the forums and get on the calendar and sign up for one of these events and get active and meet some people and find yourself a game and yeah, get FG Con going. We'll also have some FG days going in the, in the future as well. It's all community, community run, community put together, all that good stuff. Uh, so check out FG Days. There's a bunch of different games. Uh, there's Savage Worlds. There's Call of Cthulhu. There's 5e. There's Pathfinder. There's all kinds of stuff. Starfinder. So check out uh, on the 13th and 15th of April. Uh, plus, you can also, if you're a, a game master or a DM, and if you want to run some games during FG Con, you can also sign up now to run your games. So we've got. Uh, so we'll kind of move on to what we have on sale this week. And if you have not noticed, if you have a standard license, you can now pick up the ultimate license at a discounted price. Uh, you can, or the uh, you upgrade, know, or the upgrade as well. So it's down thirty dollars, so from one forty nine regular price down to one nineteen. And of course, if you get the upgrade, that will also reflect uh, as well when you go to check out on the upgrade. So we've also got to see that we've got Rick here this week. We've also got the Call of Cthulhu rule set, 7th edition. Uh, it is on sale for $20.99, so it's 7 bucks off. 
and it's by Chaosium Incorporated. And this freshly remastered from the sixth edition, this rule set lets you uh, let you and your players explore the dark mysteries of H.P. Lovecraft's horrific imagination. Too bad he didn't live longer, you know. Just think of, <laughs> if he had some more years in him, all of the other chaotic stuff he would have created in a, in his lifetime. So we've also got the uh, the Investigator Handbook for Call of Cthulhu Seventh Edition. It's on sale for seventeen twenty four. Uh, regular price is twenty two ninety nine. That's also by Chaosium. And this mod adds expanded player options with new occupations, uh, new skill descriptions, and organizations for investigators like you to join or interact with. Then lastly, we've got the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Sword Coast Adventures Guide, or SCAG, as a lot of people call it. The first time I heard it, I was like, what is SCAG? But it's by Wizards of the Coast. It's on sale for $23.99. It's 6 bucks off. And DMs can use the Atlas of the Sword Coast. Everything is taken care of you. You can just open up the map. You can click on one of the pins where the locations are. All of that data for the location, will put, it's beautifully put together. There's all kinds of new player options provided uh, new archetypes for the, like the Purple Dragon Knight, the Swashbuckler Rogue, along with some new sub races. Uh, and activating the player module adds new options during character uh, building. So it, whenever you go to select your archetype at level two or level three, whenever you get it, it will pull that uh, data in from everything that you have activated. So uh, very well put together. Uh, that is the sale items this week. We've got a couple of new releases this week. Pretty much we've got three new Pathfinder releases. The first is the Bestiary 3, as I mentioned. That was on the top sellers list yesterday. It's uh, retail price is $39.99. And you also get a PDF as well. Whenever you, you, you got to make sure that you, your, uh, your Fantasy Grounds account is linked to Paizo and their website. So whenever you buy the Fantasy Grounds product, you'll get the PDF. If you own the PDF on the Paizo side, you'll get a discount if your account is linked and uh, take advantage of that. So uh, Bestiary 3 uh, in Fantasy Grounds unlocks an additional 300 plus monsters for you, a bunch of uh, options on summoned creatures, familiars, animal companions, and a couple of new playable races such as the Rat Folk and the Genie Blood uh, and more. Uh, we have also got parts five and six of the adventure path for Mummy's Mask. And this is part five is the Slave Trenches of uh, Hakatep. It's $22.99 retail. And part five is targeted for 13th level characters. And you are trying to bring down the Flying Pyramid of the Sky Pharaoh. And we've also got part six, which is the epic conclusion of the adventure path for Mummy's Mask. And this is where the players enter the grounded Flying Pyramid and battle the reborn Sky Pharaoh Hakatep himself. So those are both $22.99. And like I said, when you have your Paizo account linked, you'll also get the PDF. And if you have already bought the PDF, you'll get that discount from the Fantasy Grounds price. So check those out. Those are by Paizo. And uh, I think that's it for new releases and uh, stuff like that. So Doug, there is one other announcement though, that a uh, huge announcement that uh, Paizo made yesterday on their social media outlets. They are going with Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And it looks like they're doing a more rule light version uh, compared to what the 3.5 OGL has. So I think that's a good thing. I really do. I think that's, yeah, a, I think uh, that's a great thing. It'll be interesting. It's going to go through a, a play test. Uh, and then uh, I think the play test begins on August uh, 2nd or so. And then mm -hmm. after that, it'll um, um, be in production. I don't think it releases until 2019. So we're going to definitely keep monitoring that. They, they've they been really good about trying to give us some advanced notification of, of things. And so hopefully we'll get a little bit more uh, heads up once they start to finalize the rules and, and figure out what that'll look like within Fantasy Grounds. If it's going to be a, a brand new rule set, which I ex expect it will, uh, or if it's just going to be an incremental change, kind of like what we did with Call of Duty 6th edition and 7th edition, where uh, stuff can can perhaps run through a convert, simple conversion process or not. So we don't know until we really see what the rules are going to look like, but yeah. um, that's that's definitely something we're gonna we're gonna keep an eye on for sure. Yeah, I know that the the appendices in the Starfinder rulebook, the core book, it had a lot of legacy stuff to how you could convert characters, convert monsters, and stuff. So I'm sure they'll probably touch on that too. So, so Banak asked about uh, will we be supporting the playtest, uh, and that's still kind of an unknown because we don't know how 
uh, much it deviates from our existing system. So building rule sets are not something we can just do overnight. And if, if the rules are constantly changing, um, coding is expensive and time, time consuming. So uh, we may not immediately uh, support all of the features or you'll just, you know, we'll re recommend people play with, um, you know, a base core RPG, try out the rules that way, um, perhaps. Yeah, they've been pretty good with this. I'm, I'm sure we'll probably have it fully supported when it's officially released. So I'm sure that that will definitely be in the in the pipeline. So, but yeah, looks like a, after a long, long, long life of Pathfinder, it looks like they're going to move on to uh, Pathfinder Second Edition and probably wrap up the Adventure Pass with the new. Uh, I think it was the what was the first adventure path that they had rise of the rune lord so i guess they're going to revisit that again and then move on to uh 2e so it's exciting i think it's i think it could be a good thing for the industry so hey why not it's good to see a, a you know a company you know evolve and do something different so so i'm seeing a couple more questions and try to save mm -hmm. uh i mean feel free to shoot them out there but uh we're going to probably save some of the questions and answers for uh later in the stream so we want to get back into the interview with rick mm -hmm. since he he joined mm -hmm. us um and then you know obviously have lots of questions regarding call of cthulhu and chaosium in general uh you know hit us up with all of those if you have other questions as well we'll, we'll try to hit those and address those as well too oh. um, as time permits Banach will have some Call of Cthulhu questions. I can guarantee that. So <laughs> I know Banach will. All right. So we've uh, gone through everything that we needed to go through this week, Doug. I think it's time to go to the war room and uh, do some waterboarding with uh, Rick Mines. So welcome, Rick. Welcome to the Fantasy Grounds Fridays that we do. And so why don't you uh, tell us a little bit of how you got started, how you got started with gaming, maybe a little bit of the industry and how you got involved with Chaosium, what Chaosium's all about, the products you guys produce. I'm sure inquiring minds would like to know that. Yeah, just a few questions in there. <laughs> yeah. That's sort the of like show. a part A to F question, I guess. <laughs> so to answer question two, Roman numeral four, part A. Uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, great to have a chance to connect with a lot of our fans and everything. And so, uh, Hope I can answer as many questions as possible. But uh, in terms of how I got involved with Chaosium, you know, I, I grew up with the company. I started playing their games in the very late 70s with RuneQuest. I was fortunate that I got to play Call of Cthulhu when it came out in 1981. You know, played Stormbringer when it came out. My, my game master was a wonderful guy. He would always come home with that big two-inch box of Chaosium stuff. And so we just went, the only reason we stopped playing Call of Cthulhu is because Stormbringer is the next game he bought. And then we went on to just game after game like that. And I've had a love of Chaosium games, as, as you can see on the shelves here, uh, yeah. for quite a number of years. And I'm the kind of guy that keeps all my toys in pretty good shape. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I like to have uh, all the material close at hand. But, you know, about five years ago, I started working more closely with Greg Stafford on a number of projects. And he was getting close to ready to retire from gaming. And that's when we got more heavily involved in RuneQuest and Glorantha and basically purchased all of that intellectual property from Greg Stafford. When I say we, I mean uh, me and my business partners as Moon Design Publications. And we just kept producing more of this on a part-time basis. And then about three years ago in 2015, you know, Greg and Sandy Peterson, shareholders in Chaosium Inc., they were very concerned about the status of the Horror on the Orient Express Kickstarters and the Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition Kickstarter. And, you know, in a conversation with Greg, he just said to me, you know, Rick, we'd love to have somebody like you running the show, but we know you'd never quit your day job and want to switch over to winning Chaosium. But after 25 years in the automotive industry, I was ready for a change because I, I have been a corporate trainer for many, many decades since I got out of college. It was the only job I had up until I decided it was time for a career change and started working for Chaosium full-time. And nice. that was uh, June of 2015, which yeah, I would have done nice. it 10 years earlier. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, and you've done a lot of great, great things with turning around those Kickstarters, too, because they were, you know, like a lot of Kickstarters do, they almost suffer from too much success. You know, like if you don't plan for the success that they get as far as the number of backers and that sort of stuff, you can very quickly get overwhelmed. And I've seen a lot of very good creative people struggle with the fulfillment process Whereas, you know, some people are much better at doing the fulfillment and organizing and keeping it all, you know, intact. And, and so when you came in, you kind of had this big 
like weight on your shoulders from oh, that. Yes. And you dug oh, yes. yourself out from it. And I think you regained the trust of a lot of people who were starting to to lose the trust with chaos and because of that. Right. So, well, thank you. It's, it's good to hear that. We, we put in a lot of, you know, time, effort, money to fulfill every Kickstarter reward we could starting with horror on the Orient Express, mm -hmm. but also it was just about time to go to print with the seventh edition Kickstarter. We had to do uh, last bits of layout and other production work, but then we had a very large series of printing bills we had to fund. Yeah. And so, but you know, speaking of, you know, horror on the Orient Express, When it came out many, many years ago, it was this nice little one-inch uh, cigarette packet kind of box. Mm -hmm. Wonderful campaign. Love playing in it. And then the new version, and we have a couple of side-by-side -side photos on our website. <laughs> nice. You know, you're talking a three-inch box compared to a one-inch box. And, you know, it's stuffed so full that, you know, one of the problems even was that the box can split because, you know, it weighs 10 pounds worth of, you know, uh, goodness in there. And I know you were asking a little bit about uh, the production of it and all that. And so, you know, it's got a wide variety of extra handouts, you know, passports, mm -hmm. uh, play aids. They even threw in a little, uh, it, they're not matches because you can't ship explosives through the mail. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they, they did put a, even a little thing of toothpicks here in a, in a, they have a matchbook box. They have, you know, the uh, we have the assemble your own set of car simulacrum statue, you know, so you can see it's going <laughs> to kill you eventually in the campaign. Sorry about the spoiler. Uh, <laughs> but even, you know, smaller handouts, like a little handout, a traveler's companion for all the people playing the campaign. And then, of course, there's a huge series of books, you know, totaling way beyond what it had in the original campaign. So instead of just that one inch of books, mm -hmm. you've got a series of five main books. Wow. wow. And so, you know, and, you know, one of the one of the things it just it was overwhelmingly larger and heavier than they originally planned it being. And so yeah. it uh, it cost a lot of, to fulfill that Kickstarter, but we did not want to see the company fail. And yeah. so we just kept shipping product. We had a big fire sale on the website to bring in some extra cash. And uh, we got it all shipped. And the 7th edition Kickstarter is totally done. And I'm also happy to announce that, you know, with the 7th edition Kickstarter, which instead of just a simple rule book and all that, it became, you know, a slipcase set. Nice. You know, the you know the investigator's handbook, the keeper's rule book, and a whole keeper screen and all that. You know, much different than just a simple rule book, which, you know, the previous edition, this was it. Yeah. So, and so we had to get all that printed and then we had to get it all shipped with incredibly tight budget because a yeah. lot of the money. Well, I mean, a lot spent. of companies, uh, you know, when they when they have unexpected bills, printing costs and shipping costs and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of people just they don't realize how many how many companies go under because of that. You have a successful Kickstarter theoretically, and then uh, that that kills companies. And uh, to oh, yeah. see when you when you came in specifically, and uh, you know you you were kind of saddled with that situation, and you made the choice to to personally take it that on and do that fulfillment. To me, that uh, completely raised uh, you know my not that i had a bad view of uh, but whenever i see someone do that kind of thing you're like that's that's doing the right thing uh for the consumer and it's and it's unfortunately rare a lot of times in, in today's society for businesses to do that to step up to the plate and, and really uh you know deliver on that and so i know with myself that really stood out as a very memorable moment in the industry well, thank you. I know, you know, my, my business partners and I, you know, Jeff Richard, Neil Robinson, Michael O'Brien and myself, you know, we spent, as I said, a lot of time and a lot of our money making sure that that Kickstarter was going to succeed because all four of us grew up with the company. You know, just like yeah. I said, I started playing the games in the 70s. So did all my business partners. We're all about 50 years old mm -hmm. and we've been playing the game since we were teenagers. Yeah. And so we, we just didn't want to see the company fail. We didn't want to see it potentially get broken up and, you know, the rights to Call of Cthulhu go to somebody else or other games just get totally dropped. We wanted to see the company thrive. And, yeah. you know, because and everybody always said the people at Chaosium are great. It was sometimes just the business got in the way. You know, I know Greg Stafford, the mm -hmm. founder of Chaosium back in 1975, he's done a number of, especially at Gen Con, 
uh, panels just describing the situation and the history of the company and how he thought the third time they were going to go bankrupt was going to be the time they actually went bankrupt. But we were able yeah. to stop the company from going bankrupt the third time they were on the brink. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things too, is you got a lot of these companies that have been around for such a long time and people are getting older, they're starting to retire and we really need, um, you know, the younger fans and followers who are now in a, in a financial position to be able to come in and, and, and do that. And they have the passion and they have the knowledge, the product knowledge to take it and, and move it forward. So we need more and more of that, you know, uh, on mm -hmm. a lot of these licenses, cause there's a lot of really good, really good, great games out there. And, uh, and obviously chaos and being, one of one of the pillars, you know, in the RPG world, it, it's definitely good to see it under under a good stewardship, kind of going forward for many many decades to go. Oh yes, no, I, I want to do this job for many many years to come. I don't have any plans on retiring. And then you have to start planning years. 20, 30 years down the road what you're going to do. You have to have almost like a, a, <laughs> a, a passing it down through uh, through the ages, you know. Oh yeah, no, I, I certainly we're trying to get all of our kids involved in gaming. Uh, yeah. and looking very much the next generation and also appealing to them with our products and the type of games we have, you know? Okay. And so I know one of the games just to get kind of as an introduction to Glorantha, we recently did uh, Kana Cons. This came out in the last, you know, nine months and it was a Kickstarter last year. Just, uh, you know, uh, basically a $20 family game, a card game, but it introduces them to the world of Glorantha. And so, you know, they get to... Sorry if I keep bending over to grab product, but yeah, you know okay. it uh, allows them to play cons. It's it's very visual. Yeah. It's very quick play. It just has all the fun little quirky things from the world of Glorantha in it, and you know it's a very much a pick up and play game. You know, it takes only a few minutes to learn. We demo it at conventions. It's it's popular with families with kids. You know that are seven, ten, twelve years old, but just getting them you know into the world of Glorantha, and mm -hmm. our next Kickstarter is going to be an, another game by Reiner Canizia because Kana Cons is by Reiner Canizia as is Miskatonic University. And I, I wish I had a, a better uh, prototype to show you, but we're just wrapping up the layout on it in advance of the Kickstarter because one of the things we've learned with all of our Kickstarters is we want to have basically a finished product with just a few stretch goal add-ons, mm -hmm. but small, modest ones, you know, improving the, the components of the game, making it, you know, nicer stock, thicker card stock, uh, maybe adding uh, extra translations into other languages in the rule book, but having the game basically totally done so we don't potentially suffer from one or two years worth of an extended writing or expansion of things where, you know, if I could uh, just digress a teeny bit, with uh, the first Kickstarter I was involved in before I was with Chaosium was the Guide to Glorantha. And we start out with trying to do a 400-page book. And because of stretch goals, it became two 400 page books oh wow yeah and you know these are great big 10 by 12 monsters that uh this weighs you know about 14 pounds wow. and you know one of the lessons we learned on that kickstarter is you know we didn't charge quite enough for shipping but you know we were talking about some uh, kickstarter problems one of the problems was totally not in, within our control when the United States Postal Service raised rates 10% one January. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, here we are getting the book printed. We're looking forward to shipping it early in the year. But we know as of January 10th, they were going to raise prices 10%. Yeah. And when, you're, yeah. when you've already got a postage bill of like fifty or $60,000, another five or six grand just went out the door. Yeah. But, you know, we did get... This two volume set all out to the backers. They loved it. It's, you know, the encyclopedia of Glorantha. And so, you know, we're kind of, you might notice a trend here with slipcase sets and all that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, they're certainly very popular. So, yes, yeah, are. certainly. Well, I mean, you've got a huge collection on your bookshelf behind you. And so, uh, you know, as, as someone who, who keeps a lot of books, slip covers are fantastic for that. Just keeps them from falling over and everything else. And it, oh, yeah. They're very popular. It's one of our best sellers. Every time we bring a bunch to conventions, like the seventh edition uh, slipcase set, we almost never take any home. Usually, we're disappointing people on the last day of the convention saying, <laughs> "The last one two hours ago." Here's a here's a coupon for ten percent off on our website. If you want to pick one up. So uh, I didn't grow up with with Call of Cthulhu uh, like I did with some of the other games that I you know played in the role playing space. Um, 
And I remember when I first came on board with Fantasy Grounds and we had some Call of Cthulhu conversions and stuff like that, they were already there that, you know, I had acquired the intellectual property for the conversions. Um, and so we were selling those those products and, and I'd get new ones into review. And uh, I remember instantly being uh, kind of grabbed by the how the handouts looked really, really mm -hmm. caught me. It captured me, you know, so a lot yeah. of stuff in the 1920s, you had typed looking letters and stuff like that, that you might oh. find or, you know, an open matchbook with a handwritten note on it. I mean, that that really stood out to me as something that really, truly set Call of Cthulhu apart from other games that I'd played. Um, oh, yeah. Props. Props are hugely important to a lot of players of Call of Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. While you don't absolutely need to have them, you know, one of the things that people like about buying directly from us on our website is that we give a free PDF with every book they buy. And mm -hmm. one of the big reasons they like the PDFs, uh, you know, they surely want to, a lot of people read it on their tablet or whatever, on their smartphone or whatever. But a lot of people love getting that free PDF because they can print out extra handouts and they don't have to yeah. potentially chop the book apart. Because I, I couldn't chop a book apart. You know, <laughs> that some of the early Chaosium books where they have the handouts with perforations and lines where you can cut here and cut there. It's like, I just can't do that. I, I can't take scissors to a book or yank a page out. And so, exactly. uh, yes, the, the handouts, you know, in Horror on the Orn Express, one of those books in the, uh, you know, big box. It, all 100 and, you know, 50, 60 pages of it is just handouts where, yeah, oh, here's yes. the telegram, yeah. here's the uh, bill of sale, and then maybe mm -hmm. they'll catch the clue on there or all, you know, business Newspaper cards. things uh, mm -hmm. I thought were, were really pretty cool too. And, you know, uh, old letter, like the envelopes with some mm -hmm. little stuff written on it. You know, I mean, just, it was really, really well done. And uh, mm -hmm. at least with, um, with fancy grounds, one of the, one of the things I like about like with our, with our part of fancy grounds is that you can do the handouts really easily to the entire table or to individual players because sometimes it's just one player that finds something, and then it's up to them to then share it with the rest of the people or not. They may decide not to for whatever reason, you know, within the game. So I, I think that kind of adds an extra extra layer. I think sure. that's one thing that actually sets Call of Cthulhu apart from all of the other games in the industry is. You know the word props. I mean, as a DM, I love props, man. There's oh, nothing yeah. better wow. than giving your players handmade notes and stuff like that. And when they say, "Wow, that wasn't even actually in the in the module. Why did you make that, David?" Like, <laughs> because I, I like props. I'm like, yeah, you know, no. I, I'm, we have we have people asking us for extra sets of the luggage stickers that came with oh, or nice. on the Orient Express, or nice. that you know we had, one of the things that was really popular that was kind of surprising was that a lot of people weren't so thrilled with getting the, you know, 1920s U.S. passport. They're like, can I get a French one? I'm French, or I, I want a German passport. Yeah. So for that Kickstarter, one of the things that made it more complex was they did French passports, German passports, English passports. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people were able to buy these as kind of a mix and match. And so even collating a lot of the sets and sending people their rewards, it took a lot of collating in the Chaosium warehouse to make sure that they, they got the right postcards and they, they got the right, you know, bumper stickers and all awesome. that kind of stuff because people love those kind of visual things. And it, it does help immerse you in the game more. Yeah, it definitely does. So, so what are some other differences that set Call of Cthulhu apart is like if if for all the players out there that maybe maybe they're a Dungeons and Dragons player that's only that that's the only thing they've played sure. and they're going to sit down and play their very first Call of Cthulhu game what should they expect what should how should they get themselves in the right mode for the best enjoyment of a Call of Cthulhu game well i know one of the things we try to do in a number of our books is we have a section on setting the atmosphere and the tone and how to keep suspense going we have we have a one of our books doors to darkness is five scenarios specifically set up for new keepers that's what we tend to call game masters in call of cthulhu is they're the they're the keeper and there's a lot of tips on how to run the scenario how to pace it and so we really want to support, especially new players and game masters. And so like Doors to Darkness is solely set up to do that. I mean, anybody can play the scenarios. They're not like dumbed down scenarios, but they just have extra tips and information to help run them for newer keepers. Mm -hmm. And we have entire sections like in the Investigator Handbook, for example. In the Investigator Handbook, this is set up to give the players extra character creation examples. It tells them about the 1920s. It gives them extra information on the professions they're going to play because professions determine a lot of your skills and so on. And so we try to gear a lot of the material in the books for newer players. But, you know, what, what sets Call of Cthulhu apart, it's the only game I've played 
that, you know, it's not about really gaining power. Your character is not going to be increasing their strength and their decks and their constitution and things like that. They're not going to be wearing magic armor. They're not going to be looking for that great, you know, uh, widget or MacGuffin that's going to give them, you know, a lot of extra abilities. It's not so much about acquiring treasure. And so it's, it's more you're playing a regular human being. You're thrown into a world of there's lots going on. You really don't understand, you know, why are people disappearing? Uh, why are corpses being stolen from the morgue? Or, you know, why, why, does, why does certain people have fish-like characteristics about them? <laughs> and you're starting to investigate all these things pretty much from a point of ignorance. And, you know, your characters are the kind of people who are quite fragile. It's very easy to go insane or die in Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's great when you're at the booth at a, at a convention. We run a lot of demos, especially demos for new players. And we'll ask them, you know, oh, you played in one of our demos. What would you think of it? And a very common response with a smile on their face and talking about it very animatedly. It was awesome. I went insane and then I got eaten. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know and that was their first gaming session they weren't worried about that oh this is a long campaign where i'm going to become wealthy and all this and later on and i'm going to rule a kingdom or I, i'm going to you know have you know loads of magic items and i'm going to get you know, vastly powerful spells you know it in call of cthulhu actually most people avoid spells because a lot of bad things happen if you don't really know what you're doing it's like we didn't mean to open the gate and now yeah, you know, that one thing monster. wrong <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oops, there goes the town, you know. So yeah. Call of Cthulhu, it your characters a lot of times they just keep getting weaker and they get more fragile. They 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 can go insane more easily because as your knowledge of the Cthulhu mythos increases, your maximum sanity decreases. So when you're really knowledgeable, you know, one little thing can set you off and put you back into the insane asylum. Now, plus, yeah. it's not a traditional D twenty type of system either. So that's another another yeah. great thing about about it's Call it's a uh, percentile, you know, D one hundred. You know, it, it, a lot of the Chaosium systems, they're they're you know D one hundred, or we call them basic role playing systems. They're all from the original RuneQuest rules. You know, when Call of Cthulhu was being worked on initially by Sandy Peterson, early early mm -hmm. on, they're referring to it as RuneQuest Cthulhu. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they modified the rules significantly for what worked best for the 1920s in Call of Cthulhu and what worked best in the tone. You know, Sandy created the insanity mechanic, which was one of the brilliant strokes yeah, of the yeah. game and uh, strokes of genius, along with other things. And so that, that's what Chiasm does with a lot of its games. It takes its core basic role playing system, as it's come to be known now, which was based on RuneQuest, and they make it fit whatever the genre is. So well, I think a lot of people. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, no. Yeah, sorry. I think a lot of people can wrap their heads around really easily the percentile based system. When you say, oh, I've got a 60% chance to succeed. I mean, you yeah. can't really describe it any more clear than that. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's the number crunching and the math is pretty light most of the time in Call of Cthulhu in particular, but in all of Chaosium's games. We don't want the rules to really stand in the way and make it some, you know, complex math formula for most things. We'd rather, just like you said, if your lock picking skill is 75%, you pretty much know how often you're going to succeed. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to worry about all those different modifiers adding in and flipping mm -hmm. over four pages of a character sheet and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. oh, I think I got a plus two somewhere, but yeah, you, you were mentioning about cons. You have these packets and you do a lot of these, uh, you know, scenarios for players and stuff. Now, do you have anything on your website or any kind of like a beginner starting packet or like a, like a download that if oh, somebody absolutely. wants to give Call of Cthulhu a try and mm -hmm. they don't want to heavily invest in all the box sets, do you have something that they can download and where, where to find oh, it? Oh yeah. No, we have uh, a number of free downloads on the website. We have the Call of Cthulhu seventh edition quick start, which takes you very quickly through an overview of the rules it then lets you roll up a character, and then it has a scenario that you can play through. And along with, you know, and that's just a, you know, a 32 page item, but you can download it for free. You can buy a paper copy on the website if you'd rather have it on paper. But the, the download on Drive Through RPG and our website, we have those as free. And then we also have uh, a solo adventure called Alone Against the Flames, which hmm. is. Uh, once again, it takes you through all the core concepts of the rules. It shows you a little bit about how the skills work, how the weapons work, all those kind of nice. things. And so with a solo adventure, it's a, it's a free download if you just want to get the PDF, or you can buy a fairly inexpensive printed copy. 
And a lot of people, at, especially at conventions, that's a real just two grab and go items where, you know, for usually we have them on sale at the conventions is for five bucks. So it's like five bucks for the quick start, five bucks for the solo adventure. And you can be playing within 10 minutes. That's is nice. that the only solo adventure you have or do you have more than more than one? Well, no, we have, we have additional ones that are that are coming out. We just are releasing, you know, as we speak, we're releasing Alone Against the Dark in printed form. But Alone mm -hmm. Against the Dark, it's a it's an updated uh, version for seventh edition of one of the classics that came out, you know, back in the eighties. And mm -hmm. so we're, we're trying to have a number of solo adventures out there because that's how some people would prefer to play the game. They like that, you know, choose your own path type of adventure. Well, and sometimes it's easier to get to, for one person who's interested in something to try a solo adventure. I would think to try it out and see if it, if they like it first before they try to convince the rest of their group, because convincing sure. a group of people to try something new is like, pulling teeth sometimes it is you know a lot of people they've just played pathfinder they just played dnd yeah. or name any other one system and they're very resistant to wanting to learn oh i gotta learn another system and it's going to be different yeah. can't we just but play if you got that if you got the one player or the you know the person that's going to be the key for this is oh no i've played through it and it's really really fun then mm -hmm. it's yeah. it suddenly becomes a lot easier to bring the rest of the group over because you know they're not all like oh well none of us really knows what we're doing mm -hmm. um, you know so that that's definitely something, I, and someone put it in. I guess we put it in um, chat yeah. here too. So, um, yeah, chaosium.com slash free adventure. So, oh yeah. yeah, go check that out. Oh, definitely. Especially if you know, I, I know in my stream, I've had a lot of a lot of players ask me if I'm going to start running some Call of Cthulhu, and yeah, definitely now. Uh, you know, I've I've been running seven, eight, five e and you know games and stuff like that. Now I'm I'm actually doing two. So yeah, I'm I'm having a more open mind and I have read quite a bit about Call of Cthulhu and I love the insanity and I love how your characters can just, just totally freak out and on one bad roll, you know, and just go totally crazy. So yeah, I'm definitely going to be doing some Call of Cthulhu as well. And that's actually one of the, the games. And that if I'm you go crazy, does that have to be the end of, of that <laughs> character's uh, adventure or is it just something you role play for a while until they become so crazy that they're no longer, useful at all <laughs> well one, one of the one of the things we have in the game i don't know if i have it handy but we have uh keeper decks that uh they're they're, they're a little bit larger than playing cards they're more like tarot card size but mm -hmm. one of the decks we have is insanities and phobias and if somebody goes crazy it could be a wildly varying experience and so the what we have with these keeper cards what we've done is that the keeper can just hand them a card and that way they don't have to describe <laughs> what type of insanity they have or what they're afraid of. It doesn't mm -hmm. reveal anything to the other players. But then on that card, along with the, describing what the insanity or the phobia is all about, it also then gives some role-playing tips on things that might set you off, like you're, you're really afraid of you know, shadows and how you should react nice. if you're in a place where there's going to be shadows. Or you're afraid of your own reflection or you know, there's a wide variety of phobias. And so... It just to make it all the easier to role play without having the GM to describe it to the player or let the other players know. That's what that's the main reason the keeper decks are so popular is it keeps play moving and it gives the keeper another resource to pass out information without having to slow down and explain everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, do you see that the most end of the character rolling up their own characters or are they uh, taking pre gens or um, they're just doing a quicker, quicker character creation process? Do you see? One trend or over the other? Well, a lot of our scenarios will have pre-gens in it. And you're welcome to use them. Or we'll have a <laughs> section on if you want to use characters from your existing campaign, if they've lived that long. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's the one thing is uh, there's, there's uh, we don't want to have, you know, like with Horror on the Orient Express, it's rare that with, you know, over 20 main scenarios in the campaign you can play that someone's going to survive all 20, especially if they're a very aggressive, get in the face of cultists, happy to start a shootout, those type yeah. of things. You know, in, in Call of Cthulhu, there's the he who runs away lives to investigate another day is, is a really common thing. Uh, but, you know, for aggressive players, they, they might have three, four or five characters that will go <laughs> through the campaign. Uh, you know, as one, as one dies or, you know, needs to get replaced. And so we have a lot of pre-gens out there. But mm -hmm. you know, some people they have their characters they want to they want to play, and so you know we we just have instructions for rolling up a character that'll work well for this type of scenario or campaign. But yeah, 
I haven't, I haven't, I can't really say which one is more popular. Okay. We seem to, we, it's, it's definitely close whether people like pre-gens. I know when we do a lot of our, you know, demos, we have pre-gens for those. And then one hour we want you to learn Call of Cthulhu and not have too much character creation in there. But, you know, for people's own campaigns, it seems like they like to roll up their own characters more. Mm -hmm. So do you have any any tips for keepers uh, when they do have aggressive players that die? Maybe they die frequently and that sort of stuff. How do you introduce back in a new character so you get them up and back into the game again? How do you maintain continuity? That sort of stuff. Do you have any tips for the for new keepers? Some players well, will just say, I, said, I'm taking my Legos and I'm going home. I died. I'm, I'm, I'm well, out of what, here. What we, what we usually recommend for aggressive players, I mean, we do have some tips that I know. I, I wish Mike Mason was here because, he, you know, he is the one of the main authors with Paul Fricker for 7th edition, lifetime uh, Call of Cthulhu player since way back in the day. And he's he's great at those kind of seminars. I always feel like, what would mm -hmm. Mike Mason say right now? I mean, <laughs> usually... You know, it depends on where they are in the scenario, but usually because you're working with a group of individuals and they're relatively normal everyday individuals, it's usually pretty easy to introduce somebody else in, in terms of the university has sent another archeology span uh, professor to help with the investigations. Uh, you know, you could send a telegram asking for additional assistance from the patron who's funding some of this campaign. It, it's usually fairly easy to introduce new players as opposed to like, okay, let's go back to the tavern and hope another barbarian walks in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But and you know, the, the telegram people, uh, writes back and they're like, okay, but this is the fourth archeologist I've sent you this week. You know, <laughs> you, <laughs> we're not getting any volunteers <laughs> anymore. And they're all named Sluggo, Sluggo one to four. What's going on with that? <laughs> yeah, I, this is my other brother. Yeah. <laughs> for, for those that really like action-oriented Cthulhu, and there are a lot of people that, you know, their characters being really fragile and going insane rather quickly, that was not as appealing to them. What we came up with, and it only took us about 15 years to get it uh, created, was Pulp Cthulhu. Yeah. And this oh, is yeah. where, as we, as we call it, this is much more of an Indiana Jones style of play where you can take a lot more punches than the average person. You can get dragged behind a truck for eight miles as you fight somebody. <laughs> uh, you can, and on the, on the cover, it's got, you know, Cthulhu there, you know, near the Statue of Liberty and all this and all that. And there are people shooting guns at him. And we kind of sometimes describe this as you can punch Cthulhu and maybe live, you know, <laughs> this is where you can scale the game to... Uh, much tougher characters. They, you know, have lots more skills, lots more toughness. And we we have in the in the pulp Cthulhu what we call the pulpo meter. Do you want it very pulpy, or do you want it just a little bit pulpy? Or do you and want a lot your of people have found? Pulp. Yeah, there you go. And so a lot of people have found that they were actually playing kind of a pulp Cthulhu style campaign already, even before mm -hmm. this came out, because they wanted their characters to survive more than one or two or three sessions. You know, they get very attached to them. They invest a lot in them. They see it as an extension of part of their own imagination and who they are. And they don't want to say goodbye to characters so often. And so Pulp Cthulhu really makes that easier to do. So is that compatible with the seventh edition or, or sixth edition? Oh, totally. It's okay. seventh edition. Uh, everything we publish awesome. now is seventh edition. Okay. We, we love the yeah. sixth edition. We love the fifth edition. I, 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 I still love the first edition that I played. But the thing is, we, we really have stressed backwards compatibility. And so you can run our adventures, our scenarios, and so on. Even they're coming out and they're written for seventh edition. Most people just have to tweak a few numbers, keep in mind of a few simple things to run it for earlier editions. So if, you, if you're still playing with the sixth edition, we haven't had hardly any complaints about the, oh, I can't play this with my edition. Well, in fact, that's one of the things that I was going to uh, bring up that we've you already pretty much touched on is the so seventh edition came out and a lot of people are used to, you know, game systems where a new edition comes out and completely invalidates everything that it had come before that or is completely not compatible. But at least with like the Call of Cthulhu seventh edition rule set we have for Fantasy Grounds. And, and mm -hmm. in the book you were showing earlier uh, before yeah. we started the stream, the conversion guide is a four page guide. And so. Uh, oh, yeah. If you load up the seventh ed edition rule set and you load up a sixth edition adventure, it'll convert everything over for you. So you can still play some of the great, great systems like uh, Mask of Nyar, the Hotep, um, or. There's that I, name I, again. I think I got that right, right? That was good. good Trail of me. <laughs> Stathagua? Is that how that other one's pronounced? I, it, you guys are, are uh, I feel like I'm Dr. Seuss in it up sometimes when I try to uh, read off the names. Um, either that yeah. or I'm going to summon a, summon Cthulhu to beat me down for saying it wrong. No, no. I, I, you know, it's funny because 
historically, chaosium has had in a number of the rule books and other supplements a pronunciation guide with one or two pages of the typical pronunciation of Cthulhu, whether it's you know Cthulhu, Cthulhu, uh, you know, really, yeah. Uh, Nyarlathotep, uh, Shathagua. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing some of those. And I'm sure some of the real <laughs> Cthulhu experts are cringing with every one of those I'm saying. But yeah, we, we have pronunciation guides. And you know, the fact that people can laugh about it in some ways, that's the most important thing. Just because yeah, we don't want to take it too seriously. But yeah, well, we've got, we got a lot of guys from England who play in Australia. So they pronounce everything wrong. And, and you're on the stream. <laughs> You guys don't know how to speak proper English from England. You know, I mean, you got to listen to the American version now. We we've, we've we've taken it and ran with it. So Doug's making friends. <laughs> making friends. <laughs> Colin's one of the people on here. Mad Beardman yeah. on that on the stream. So he's yeah. done a lot of great work for us and a lot yeah, of conversions. No. But you know, speaking of seventh edition versus earlier editions, as you mentioned, you know, in in the back of the rule book. We have just a few short pages explaining what's involved with how to update a character to the latest edition. It's just a few pages. It's little tweaks here and there. It's not a major rewrite, you know. And in terms of rules, you know, we, we've we've definitely adjusted a few, but for the most part, it's adding on some things that could be optional. Like people felt that when a chase was going on, you know, trying to flee monsters or flee cultists and things like that, it wasn't as interesting. And so we came up with chase rules that make that, you know, a, a more fun, interesting, suspenseful part of the game. We also, be, you know, people who really cared about certain events and really wanted to, you know, risk all to succeed, we introduced pushing your luck. But none of these things are, you, you call, oh, well, that affects all the gameplay. It's, it's just portions of it that we tried to refine and make better. You know, because Call of Cthulhu has been around since 1981 and, you know, role playing has changed. People's approaches to what they find most enjoyable in role playing has changed and we want to support that. Mm -hmm. But we don't just want to say, throw away everything you had from the last edition, folks, and wait for it to get reprinted in the new edition or whatever. We're, mm -hmm. we're not into that. I, that but you are looking to do a reprint for <laughs> uh, Mask of Nair, the Hotep. So is that going to be something similar to like with Horient? Uh, horror on the Orient Express, where you you add just more content and more stuff to it. Well, I, yeah, with Masinal Thotep, it is one that is going through layout right now. We're planning on releasing it later this year. It's it's going to be a slipcase set just because it's so popular. But it's about five hundred and fifty pages of material, wow. and so we didn't want to have a single five hundred plus page book. Those tend to break. The spine won't hold up. It, it, it wears too quickly. So we're looking at having it be two 256-page mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. and also a bunch of handouts, like, you know, and, and so on uh, to support that. And so it's going to look a lot like the Call of Cthulhu 7th edition slipcase set. It's, it's mainly going to be sold just as the set, although we'll have some as replacements and we'll probably sell the handouts as a separate just because people sometimes want to get a second set of that if they've run the campaign a second time and so on. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it is an expansion of the material. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's something that has been played for decades because it originally came out in the 80s. And so, yeah, it is much bigger, but, you know, it, it's we've added extra scenarios and expanded the campaign based on what players have been suggesting or adding on themselves for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So That's what great. kind of uh, what kind of releases do you have? I know that you were mentioning a couple of releases here. Uh, what else do you have planned for 2018? Well, uh, in, in no particular order, you know, one of the things is we are in the process of getting all the 13th Age Glorantha Kickstarter rewards printed. Basically, the core rule book, 13th Age Glorantha, and the Glorantha source book, those are the two main printed deliverables from the Kickstarter. Those are the layouts done. They're going through the early printing production phase. And so those will be out this summer. And then we also have the Miskatonic University board game by Reiner Canizia, which we're going to be kickstarting uh, in the not too distant future. It's going through final, final layout of all the components and everything. And we've got the Kickstarter all prepared. We just haven't launched it on Kickstarter yet, but more on that soon. It'll certainly be within the next few months, we're thinking. And then we have uh, the new edition of RuneQuest called RuneQuest Roleplaying in Glorantha. Uh, coming out, you know, this is a lot, you know, Chaosium last published their own version of this back in the 80s. Uh -huh. And it had a number of other publishers that was licensed out Avalon Hill and so on. And now it's back in house. And so we have that new edition coming out with a slipcase set, it's going to have the, 
the main core rule book. It's going to have a bestiary. It's going to have, uh, you know, a, a game master screen pack. It's going to be in a slipcase set, but also sold as individual items. And then as we were briefly talking about, we have the massive Nalathotep campaign that's being re-released as a slipcase set. And that's going through layout. It's We're about two thirds of the way done with that. It's looking really beautiful. It's certainly the production values, you know, full cover, uh, full color, hardcover books. That's pretty much our standard now for everything, except for our just our very small uh, products that we do, you know, for like the quick start and the uh, solo scenarios. We, we want low price points. And for those, we do, you know, black and white interior. But nice. yeah, the mass campaign will be out later this year. And then we also have uh, a relaunch of our fiction line. You know, it, the top shelf over on that side, we have, you know, over 50 fiction titles that Chaosium has put out since, you know, the 80s, uh, so late 80s, early 90s. And we paused that because we had to rethink about it. And because the book market has changed so much, especially with game shops, some of them not carrying fiction anymore, or bookstores have changed so radically uh, since the 90s when the fiction line was in its heyday that we brought on James Lauder to help us relaunch that later this year with uh, Leaves of the Necronomicon and another book called Sisterhood. And so we're going to have a book a quarter coming out with our fiction line again starting later this year. Well, that's a huge year, man. That's that's a bunch of stuff going on. No, not done yet. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, uh, we also, you know, one of our uh, favorite licensees, we we have many licensees with doing, you know, foreign language translations and so on. But uh, we want to, you know, have Call of Cthulhu reach a lot of people in different ways. And one of the big things that's coming out later this year from Focus Home Interactive is the Call of Cthulhu, you know, RPG game for Xbox and PlayStation. And so, you know, Cyanide Studios working with Focus Home Interactive, they have that game coming out uh, toward the end of this year. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds awesome. I'll be grabbing that as soon as that comes out, too. I I love seeing, uh, you know, games in different mediums, you know, as well and just experiencing them in completely different ways. Like um, back in the day, choose your own adventure books and stuff like that. You know, it's like just in board games and card mm. games and, and all that sort of stuff. Just the more of those you play, the more it kind of builds upon itself, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we've got about and 10 so- minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Rick. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, we, so we've got a 10 minutes left about it. We want yeah, to get we to got Q&A a bunch now? of people. Well, no, go ahead. And what what you were uh, well, going to go ahead? The and last mention. thing I wanted to st- mention is that you know we're very rapidly getting to where we're going to have one or more releases every month. Between mm. you know we're looking at six mm. products a year for RuneQuest role playing in Glorantha. We're looking at more than twelve products a year for Call of Cthulhu, and so we want to have people have a lot of material, a wealth of material to uh, choose from, and. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned RuneQuest, and that's one of the ones I know Colin specifically is very interested in doing a RuneQuest rule set. He's he's done uh, more recently, just finished up the uh, what's old as new rule set, and he's and he's doing some work on uh, Traveler RPG afterwards. But uh, he's one of our one of our fewer devs who is capable of of actually building out a full rule set. Um, and we don't have RuneQuest yet for fantasy oh, grounds. It, we're we're more than happy to get it onto fantasy grounds. Okay. And so it's it's in layout, and so depending on what you need, uh, we'd be more than happy to get that to you as soon as possible, and get RuneQuest added onto Fantasy Grounds. You know, because I mean, okay. online role playing via Fantasy you know Grounds and a number of other providers, that's that's the number one way people can find a gaming group these days. It's hard to yep. you know find. Unfortunately, I mean, I love sitting around a table with four or five other people and playing a game for X number of hours and having pizza and all that, but. For a lot of people, that's tougher to do, and so online role playing is a, a huge part of our market. And you know, we yeah, love what yeah. Fantasy Grounds does with their products. So adding RuneQuest onto that—that's uh, that's a definite, uh, all capital letters, yes. All right, nice. fantastic. Yeah, nice. I mean, it's one of the I love be- being around the table as well. Um, and it just, like you say, it just gets harder and harder to do. You know, for for many of us, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So Matt Beardman's got a a question for you. He's uh, wondering if there are any plans to update Beyond the Mountains of Madness to 7th edition. Yes, there is. We have that in the works. It's uh, one of these things that it's not a this year product, but we are, you know, we've been in in, uh, talks with the original authors and looking at updating it. And so, yes, Beyond the Mountains of Madness is on our, we're going to get that done sometime in the next few years. Nice. 
Another question from Fantasy Grounds uh, College is, have you ever entertained or considered buying the rights to publish the, uh, and revamp our Talsorian Cyberpunk from 2000, well, Cyberpunk 2020? Um, it's a great system. I remember playing it back in the day. I, you know, it's, it's you know, Cyberpunk, it's, you know, even that one word just kind of defines that genre. Yeah. Uh, we haven't been in talks with anybody at uh, our Talsorian and so on to get that one, but Thank you for the suggestion. Well, I think Beardman was saying that uh, I guess uh, Tussorian's already updating it and Cyberpunk Red might be out this year or something like that. Oh, so. cool. I, I, w I wish him a lot of success with that. Look forward to seeing it. Nothing like putting you on the spot to say, hey, do you want to buy the rights or something <laughs> and produce it? <laughs> so <clears throat> I, have a, I have a question for you. Is there... Is there any particular story within Call of Cthulhu that you just absolutely love playing or running? And do you actually prefer, you know, being the, the keeper or do you enjoy doing the playing? In Call of Cthulhu, I was always a player. My, mm -hmm. my game master, Tim, had read every, you know, H.P. Lovecraft and August Derleth novel there was related to that. He knew the mythos inside and out. And he, he largely did his own... Uh, campaigns of his own creation and I was always a player in that I you know my my favorite one you know I, I only played through part of masks and I really loved that I, I actually I've, I've been running through that as part of the play test for the new edition and so that's that's kind of in the forefront of my mind right now would be, would be masks Banak was a uh, Banak he's from the UK he's he's wondering You've shown a bunch of these products, you know, on, on the stream and stuff. Uh, is, are these going to be Fantasy Grounds too? I think that might just have to do with getting them actually done, right? It, yeah, it's, a lot of it's on done. us. Yeah. Um, for, for everybody on the stream, uh, Chaosium, for the most part, if we come to them and say, hey, we'd like to put this out there, I don't think I've ever received any answer other than, yes, absolutely, here you go. You know, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's more of we have to have, you know, our developers lined up for it. We have to know what people are wanting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if you see a product out there that you're like, hey, I really love this product. I'd love to see it on Fantasy Grounds. Let us know. We can then see if we can get, you know, one of our developers, you know, such, you know, Collins in here, uh, Matt Beardman is one of those. Yeah. Um, then, uh, you know, we can try to get the right resources and, and get that in the queue to be worked on. And it just takes a little bit of time, you know, to filter in with all the other work that, that's going on. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, um, it's something that we can do. But you got to let us know what you want. Sure. I, yeah, we're happy to, as long as we, you know, anything 7th edition, we'd love to see it all on Fantasy Ground. Same thing with RuneQuest. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only tricky bit is if somebody wants a, one of the more classic products from years and years ago, there are a few of those, not many of them, but there are a few of those that we don't currently have the rights to reprint. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you know, it's all fair game. and We'd love to see Fantasy Grounds have it up there someday. I just know it's tough with you guys got so many choices as to what you're going to work on next. So the yeah, novels, yeah, Cthulhu, uh, we do have that in fantasy grounds right now too. So yeah. that is available already. Um, somebody asked about uh, the books, the novels that you have coming out. Are those going to be available on Kindle as well? Oh yes. We're going to have them, you know, as e-publications in a variety of formats, including Kindle, uh, you know, it'll be on Amazon and so on. We, we don't want to limit uh, people's availability to read those. And we realize for a lot of people that's in a variety of electronic formats, just not paper. That's just the way I think the book industry is starting to go anyway, more digital. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I see less and less books that I think company because of the whole cost and, you know, but people running out of shelf space. That's I, that too. I, I just, <laughs> I just built a, you know, 15 foot long bookcase with 32 cubes and I still got 10 boxes left. I don't have room for. So, I mean, no, so uh, there's one other question, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. It is uh, 11 o'clock, and thank you so much, Rick, for coming on. Uh, oh, Fantasy Grounds College, the, yeah, it's been awesome. And would Castles, um, so Castles and Crusades, I, 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 every time I see COC, I think Cas Castles and Crusades and Call of Cthulhu. I don't know why, but uh, for Call of Cthulhu, would the Penny Dreadful series work for something like a, a Call of Cthulhu I, I think it's a great series, and I think it could easily work. Yeah. So there you go. I, I don't have any questions. Have you, well, I guess to follow that up, I'm very interested in, in yeah. that kind of thing, too, because I yeah. see a lot of other uh, publishers reaching out more and more to um, Hollywood, basically, to, to do stuff. And I don't know if you guys have, have done any of those, made any of those connections. There's been a couple of different mm -hmm. 
Lovecraft based like movies and stuff like that. Oh like yeah, the Dunwich Horror. Yeah. Uh, it was the Horror on the Orient Express movie, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Orient yeah. Express movie, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, licensed properties are a very tricky thing. They can mm. be a real money maker, but they can also be a very time consuming burden. You have to manage very carefully. Mm. I know that you know Chaosium historically has had licensed properties, and some have worked out really well. Others, like you know Ringworld. We got the license yanked very early on because a big movie company wanted all the rights. Mm. And so we had to kill the line right after the box set and the companion came out. Now, that was a long time ago. And we're not saying, oh, that, that scared us off it for life. But licensing can be a very tricky thing. And if, it, if it's managed right, it can do really well. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of our uh, friends and the other you know, companies in the industry have done really well with some licensed properties. But if you sit down with them and talk with them, they'll say it can be a tricky thing. And so we're mm -hmm. not against licenses, but we just... We're picking and choosing very carefully. Sure. Well, I know Palladium had some issues because they've got some studios that are sitting on some licenses that, you know, they're, they're restricted. Like, for instance, we can't do uh, digital versions of their game because the licensing that the studios hold, even though they haven't produced anything for it yet, is mm -hmm. so comprehensive because they want to own everything. They don't want to feel like they left out one little part. And, and the tabletop side of things is often the smallest component in there and so we, you just don't get any real any real credit so they couldn't even license it to us if they want you know because you know, if somebody like disney has has it <laughs> then you know they could just sit on yes. it yes mm -hmm. so. well i think that's going to be about it for this week's uh, fantasy groans fridays uh thank you again rick for coming on it's uh it was a, an honor to get to meet you i've uh, been oh, such a, a fan for a while and and uh, it's nice to actually get to see you face face, talk about things, and uh, it's been really nice. So, well, thank you, Doug and David. It's like I said, it's been a pleasure being here, and I uh, really enjoyed my time. And I hope I didn't have to talk too fast, but I, no. you know, I it was a lot of it, it was a pleasure going through all the things that have been going on at Chaosium, especially talking about all the good things that are going on at Chaosium yeah. these days, as opposed to. When I started, you know, about three years ago, it was more talking about the how we're trying to control all the bad things going on at Chaos. It's good to see <laughs> that. Uh, yeah, this is and, and I'm nice actually going to gonna stay on just for a, a little while longer to talk because people had asked some questions about Unity mm -hmm. uh, and and wanted to kind of follow up about that one. So that's a question we get almost every week, which is why we don't really focus a whole lot of attention on it because every single time we we have an interview, you know, people are understandably very excited about it, want to know what's going on with it, and we've been working mm -hmm. on it for more than three years so when we talk about things that are big long projects um a complete rewrite of our of our software is definitely our biggest project that we've done to date and so uh, it's been working kind of in the in the background we have about one and a half developers that are devoted towards it full time uh, at, every single week and so it's progressing it's moving along very very quickly it's it's um not very quickly. It's moving along very steadily, <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's one of those things where we don't yet have the end goal in sight, and so we don't typically want to talk too much about estimated release dates on it until we feel like we're about three three months or so out from a beta, a uh, public beta test for it. So uh, that's one of the things that you know. Once we get to that point, we're all very anxious to get there. It will get there. It's it's got some fantastic stuff already in place. Oh, yeah. um, we've got great people working on it, but we're ultimately a small company. We only have four full-time people. Um, and then we have lots of contractors and commission developers um, that we use to make our company seem bigger and to produce more stuff than we than we would otherwise be able to. So uh, that's really the big thing is, is it's, um, you know, we're continuing to move forward on our current version of Fantasy Grounds with new rule sets, new content rolling out for that. All of that will be compatible with Fantasy Grounds Unity when it comes out. So you won't have, you won't have to rebuy everything. Um, and so, um, you know, we're, we're making progress on the classic side of things, uh, simultaneously with, with the unity side of things. So I knew people were loving, uh, loving to hear uh, that. I mean, possibly. Uh, so obviously we have <clears throat> some cool stuff we did showcase. Um, and it's one of those things. It's a, it's a trade-off. Do you not show anything at all? Or do you show things and keep working on it? So, um, you know, some people think, they saw that. That's one of the common fallacies in software uh, is that you can get to you can get some pretty stuff that's not production ready yet very quickly, um, and that's what happens with a lot of you'll you'll see all the time there's Kickstarters launching for new virtual tabletops constantly. I mean, there's probably about three or four, or maybe five every single year 
they're like, hey, look, we got this new Kickstarter. And they'll have some cool bells and whistles. Um, and then those new bells and whistles, they realize that, yeah, that's that's the exciting, flashy part. But there's still 90% or more of the work that's the plumbing and the behind the scenes stuff that all has to kind of uh, be put in put in place. So, so that's kind of the trade off. You know, we can either show stuff or not show stuff. And so, uh, you know, people want to have new updates and see new stuff every week. But the development cycle just it, it doesn't really lend itself to that too much. So we're working on. You know, we spent after that stuff came out with our uh, you know line of sight. We spent a lot of time working on. What I consider the plumbing, which is making the networking better, making memory management better. It's not exciting. There's not much we can show in a video to show. Oh, look, we're using less memory than we were before. Um, you know, things will work more smoothly. But um, that's stuff that all has to be there before we can get a production-ready product out the door. All right. Um, all right. Great. It's good. It's it's actually good to you know good to talk on that, you know, because a lot of people are wanting to know and to shed a little bit of insight on, you know, unity. That's a definitely a good thing. And, and you know, and, and plus once, once unity gets within, you know, the three month range of, of what Doug was talking about, I'm sure we'll probably be talking about it more and showing off some other things, but, but as of right now, it's, it's still in production. So, yeah, I mean, a rule set typically could take us anywhere from three, four months to a year to do just a rule set. Um, yeah. And that's with pretty much having a, a, a one or more dedicated people. The, our Starfinder rule set took us uh, quite a while. I think Call of Cthulhu was in work for, uh, I would say, maybe about six months with Damien and Ian Ward uh, kind of cranking through that one. And and they're both very extremely knowledgeable um, on, our, on our system. So just things, uh, unfortunately, you know, it, it looks – like it's maybe not as big of a change from one rule set to the next and uh, it should be simple, but I just, um, you know, to get something that we feel like is the quality that we like to release. Um, it takes, takes a fair amount of time to get that in place. And you know, that's the whole thing too, Doug is, you know, you want to make sure everything is right before it is actually released because I mean, that could, that could really, you know, be a bad thing as well if it's not. So yeah, you only have one opportunity to make a first impression when it finally rolls out. So that's, that's what we're going to make sure it's going to look great when it comes out. Uh, And we think fantasy grounds in this current form is is still fantastic. It doesn't have our, our line of sight, which is important for some game systems. Um, But it has lots of other bells and whistles and we haven't stopped adding. And we've added, I think three or four major releases in the last couple of years and um and lots of steady releases that we roll out all the time we just put a new version in the test channel that we're going to be rolling out soon too and all of those are going to be carried over to fancy grounds unity so we're, we're kind of getting two for two for one on all of these rule set updates all right well doug thanks for the insight on on unity and uh once again rick thanks again for coming on totally appreciate it and next week we've got uh matthew colville coming on on fantasy grounds fridays next week so you guys need to go ahead and get signed up for the newsletter follow us on all the social media outlets check out all those sales and until next friday at noon eastern happy gaming try out call of cthulhu 70 and keep using fantasy grounds until next week bye everybody have fun thanks